Hi, everyone. Welcome to a live chat with Nurse Linda. Linda Schultz is a leader and provider of rehabilitation nursing for over 30 years and a friend of the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation for close to two decades. Now I'm going to turn it over to Linda. Hi, Linda. Hi, good, good afternoon. I was just about ready to say good morning. I should advance myself through the day. And hello, everyone. It's nice to be with you. I know I say that every week, but I just want you to know I sincerely mean that. I really look forward to this time that we spend together, and I really hope that it's beneficial. I, I thank everyone who's tuned in, and for those people who were unable to tune in but decide to listen later, I really appreciate your uh, interest. Uh, so this week, I uh, this month, I've been writing in the blog about uh, bladder and uh, function and avoiding infections, and that all stemmed from a question that somebody had written in about how can I afford avoid bladder infections, and it's such a, a big topic. I thought, well, I'll, I'll write a blog about this. Well, that blog turned into two blogs because there's just so many things that you could possibly do to help yourself avoid bladder infections. However, the, unfortunately, no matter what you do, for some people, they're just more prone to bladder infections. So don't think, well, I'm not doing everything just exactly right, and so I've caused this myself. Sometimes bladder infections just happen. But there are things that you can do to help prevent bladder infections, and probably one of the uh, first things to do is to review your technique. So look at what you're doing when you do your catheterization. Now, whenever people do things routinely, um, you know, like cooking food or, um, you know, just any everyday activity, that we're supposed to be doing hand washing, that we're supposed to be doing in a certain way. What happens just because we're human, we get in a rush, we you know, we stop thinking about all the individual steps or we don't really pay attention to the amount of time that we should be dedicating to a particular activity. So it's just human nature that we kind of tend to get a little bit rushed or not really focusing exactly on what we're doing. And certainly catheterization, toileting is one of those activities because, you know, we're always pushing to go to the next thing and to stop and go to the bathroom or to stop and catheterize. That is just something that we kind of just, oh, well, you know, get it done and get it over. So if you really want to think about urinary tract infections and how you can avoid them, probably the very first thing is to be very mindful and intentional about the catheterization process. So, you know, look at uh, when you're washing your hands. And this is something that a lot of people, um, you know, have kind of skimped on because, again, it, it's just human nature. So when washing your hands before you catheterize, Think about washing your hands with soap and water or if you're out using um, hand sanitizer. But think about washing your hands, you know, is the water warm? It doesn't have to be burning hot. Don't scald yourself, but is the water warm? Are you, are you washing all four sides of your hands, so the palm, the top of your hands, and then the sides, two sides of each finger? Are you focusing on getting some soap and scrubbing around in the nails. This is all very important to do, especially in this time of COVID. We should be washing our hands. And, you know, usually people, they they rinse their hands or they wash their hands. And, oh, they're in there, you know, maybe for five, maybe ten seconds. But you really need to go for the full 20 seconds. You need to provide that friction with one hand against another to to be sure that any any kind of germs are getting off your hands. And then you need to do that immediately before you catheterize. So I, I see a lot of people that wash their hands very, very thoroughly, and then they wheel themselves to another location. Maybe they transfer onto the toilet. They adjust their clothing. Whenever you've touched anything, your hand washing has been voided because now you're picking up the germs that are everything that you're touching. So you want to position yourself so that you're catheterizing immediately before you put that before you touch that catheter. 
Now, if you uh, transfer onto the toilet, that can be kind of hard if you do your catheterization on the toilet. Very nice for the cleanup because you can just drain the urine into the toilet. But still, you've had you've transferred, you've maybe adjusted your clothes, you've done all these other touching of things. So you might want to have some hand wipes or some hand sanitizer that you can use before you start touching all your catheterization equipment. Um, just, you know, it's an extra step, I realize, but, you know, if you're having problems with infections, you're really worried about things, you really need to pay attention to all these little minutia of detail. Um, another thing is that the catheter, once you take it out of the package, you want it not to touch anything before it goes into your bladder. So if you miss the urethra, especially if you're female, sometimes it's kind of hard to hit it on the first try. It's um, Females, I always tell, you know, people are like, oh, this is just impossible. And when you're learning, it seems so impossible because it's so hard to visualize where the urethra is. So while you're learning, you can float a mirror in the toilet or use a mirror so you can see exactly where you're going. And then find the landmarks um, where your urethra is. So knowing about where to place your hands so that catheter goes straight into the urethra. Um, people will say, well, you know, that's really hard to do. But if you can feel with your hands, it's almost like typing or playing the piano. When you get to be good at those skills, you don't need to look at the keyboard or you don't need to look at the keys on the piano. You sort of learn where your fingers should be at that time by just muscle memory. And so the same thing with catheterization, you'll learn how far uh, down from the top of the um, uh, meatus or, you know, you can use other anatomical landmarks that are there to kind of feel where that catheter should be placed. And it sounds like it sounds crazy because you can't see where you're going, but by golly, people accomplish this. It does take some time, it does take some effort, but people actually do accomplish this. It's not that unusual. It's not like, oh my gosh, look at this person so rare because they're catheterizing themselves as a female without looking where they're going. But it, but people accomplish this all the time. So it does take some time and effort. Um, same thing for males, if the catheter drags across your thigh or, you know, um, you have a little bump and maybe it goes next to the urethra, but that catheter has touched your skin or it's touched anything else, then that catheter is null and void. You have to get a sterile one or a new one or re-sterilize your catheter if you're um, still within that process. So those are kind of some things to think about just in technique and clean up as well. Because when you ha if you're draining into a bag or if you're doing it into bed, think about, you know, is a little bit of urine dripping out? Does it get on your hands? Um, think about that cleanup technique. Are you washing your hands after you've uh, cleaned up your catheter supplies? Because that um, secretions or whatever can get, you know, even the lubricant can get on your hands and then that's sticky and, it's stick if you touch something the germs on from whatever you've touched now going to stick on your hands so it's all those kind of little minutia kind of detail then think about what you're putting into your body so if you're drinking a lot of sugary drinks sodas energy drinks um adding sugar to your intake all that is going to go through your kidneys to be filtered out that sugar it's going to be stored in your bladder all that extra sugar and sugar is just food for bacteria to grow. So water is really the best. It doesn't mean you have to give up your juices and your sodas and your alcoholic drinks. They ha they are more dehydrating. Um, caffeine is a, a diuretic, so a lot more is going through your bladder at certain times after those. You don't have to give up any of those drinks that you enjoy, but just look at how much you are drinking. So sometimes people who have a catheter, um, maybe that's permanently in place, either uh, through the urethra or through the abdomen, a super pubic catheter, and they enjoy soda or diet soda, and I'll see people that will drink a two-liter bottle in one day. Well, that's just feeding bacteria in your bladder, so drink two liters of uh, water 
to keep that sugar content and those extra substances up. You can still enjoy a soda or an alcoholic beverage or your coffee in the morning or coffee in the morning and in the afternoon. Just, you know, think about what you're taking in. But if you have a catheter, you want to keep the the urine flushing through your body if it's an indwelling catheter. If you're doing intermittent catheterization, you need to think about uh, monitoring your intake because, you know, you can only take in so much before you need to catheterize again. So thinking about all of those kinds of things. Now, um, that doesn't mean that you should run out and start drinking a lot of fluid. I would never recommend that. But you can increase your fluid just by a couple of sips a day, uh, a couple of sips every hour is what I should be saying. Uh, and check with your health care provider first because there are some health conditions where you really have to have a very strict fluid intake. People who have certain cardiac conditions, uh, people who are doing intermittent catheterization, um, people who have edema that will not resolve, sometimes they are put on fluid restrictions. So there might be something specific about you that you really can't increase. But just think about a few sips of water throughout the day, throughout your waking moments. The reason being is because um, you don't, you know, if somebody drinks a full glass of water, well, that flushes out your your bladder and your kidneys in, in like 10 or 20 minutes, but then after that, it's very slow again. So maintaining, maintaining consistency with a smaller amount of water is a lot better than really just start uh, drinking water profusely. So those are kind of some things to think about. Now, if you do have consistent bladder infections, you need to have a record of those with your healthcare provider because in just about every insurance, in Medicaid or any other payer system, if you have a certain number of infections within a certain time frame, you can be considered for a higher level um, type of catheterization, maybe a no-touch catheter or a sterile catheter system to avoid that. Now, it's unfortunate that you have to have so many infections before you can get that kind of system, but that is the way that the payer system works. So we have to work within that. Hopefully you won't have infections that you'll meet that criteria, so you know, hopefully you won't ever meet that and you can do just fine. If you feel like, if you're doing clean catheterization and you really want to do sterile, First of all, it's been uh, proven by research over and over and over again. When you're in your own home environment and when you're with your own germs within your own environment, home, work, school, wherever you happen to be going routinely, it's been demonstrated that your, your body builds up resistance to the bacteria within your own environment. And so clean catheterization is really a very effective way of managing your bladder. However, um, when you go to the hospital, there's a lot of bacteria in the hospital or in the rehabilitation center. So if you have a hospitalization, they will do sterile technique there just as a protection. There's a lot more people you're interacting with, maybe different people that are doing your catheterization because you're unable to for whatever reason you're in the hospital. So um, be sure and, and um, when you're in those facilities, they'll use sterile techniques. So people think, oh, I need the sterile gloves and the sterile catheterization. Really, when you're in your own environment, you really don't need all that sort of thing. But if you have repeated infections, then you'll probably get eventually put into one of those systems. Now, if you just feel like, just for my general well-being, I think I would rather do sterile technique. If you're using a new catheter every time or if you're sanitizing your catheter in between use, and because I am old, um, you know, this used to be the way people were given a red rubber catheter, and I know some people still use this technique, but people were given a red rubber catheter and you had to boil it in between uses, and you only got like, I don't know, like four catheters a month or two catheters a month. It's kind of hard to think about those things. But I know people still do it this way, which is why I mention it. Um, so um, if you think you would like to up your game a little bit, um, you can purchase yourself uh, sterile gloves. Uh, the gloves that 
come in uh, just the regular gloves that maybe you do your vow program with. Those are cleaner, um, so you could might want to use those. That was, would be extra purchases that you would have to take out of your own pocket, so you might not want to do that unless you know you get some kind of permission or get some authorization from your payer to do that. Also, you can think about talking to your case manager, and when you have a good rapport with those people, now they're following the rules of their uh, pay of the people who are are providing your health insurance. So, but sometimes if you talk to them, they might have some suggestions, or they might be able to work around in the system uh, to help you get some other products. So those are just some things to think about. Right now it's very difficult to get some of these uh, supplies, gloves and masks and stuff because of the COVID. So a lot more people are using these. But I think that's kind of easing up now. So I hope that people are having a little more. I'm seeing it in my community easing it up. up. So I hope that's easing up for you as well. Um, anyway, there's a lot more suggestions in the blogs about um, managing your bladder to avoid bladder infections. Uh, something very simple that you can do is moving your body because when urine is just sitting still in your bladder, it's stagnant. And so if there is a bacteria that gets in there, and that's pretty routine. A lot of times people have a urine specimen examined. There will be one bacteria in there. It's no big deal. Maybe there will be two or three still it's no big deal. It's when it starts multiplying and clumping together. And so you want to um, be sure and do your catheterization on time. But something you can do is to move your body. If you don't have the ability to get up and walk around, just doing your um, pressure releases uh, every 10 to 15 minutes, that will help um, move your bladder, disturb your abdomen, so that helps doing your range of motion exercises that helps uh, keep your bladder stirred up as well as it will help your bowel as well as it's helping your skin to prevent pressure uh, injury. And so just doing some of those routine things. Sometimes when you're doing something for uh, one goal, it's really helping other goals. When you get into bed at night, if you're able or if you have someone who can turn you from side to side, just turning back and forth maybe like 10 times. It can be a challenge if you're doing it yourself. It can be a challenge if somebody has to do it, but just that motion of turning back and forth um, somewhat before you go to sleep, that helps. Turning in bed at night for those pressure releases, that all helps. So when you put it all together, any kind of activity that you can provide to your lower body, that is really going to help you a lot. Um, so there's a lot of tips um, in the blogs, a lot more, but I did want to bring that up because there's just a lot of um, information about, there's just so many things you can do. Don't let it overwhelm you. Don't think, oh my gosh, I have to do all these things because it's going to take you all day to do all the things that are listed as suggestions in the blog. But pick out a few things that might help you, and as you go, you might add a few more things, and you might find, well, this is really helping me, but this isn't helping so much. So, you know, um, just, you know, make it unique to your own special needs. Um, there was a question that had come, come up, and since we're talking about it anyway, um, just to talk a little bit about uh, medications uh, to treat bladder issues, what's the most popular medications? Well, number one, the most popular medication is antibiotic. If you have a bladder infection, you need an antibiotic. If you think you have a bladder infection, you need to have your urine tested to see if it's infected or not. This is not something that, well, I'll wait a few days and I'll see how it goes. You want to get on top of an, inf of an infection right away because bacteria starts out as a very basic bacteria. But as time goes by, it likes to become stronger and stronger and stronger. So the sooner you get on top of an infection, the easier it is to treat. So most of the time, you, um, you know, mo how do you tell if you have an infection? For people who have sensation, they're going to feel burning, maybe some pain um, when they urinate. Most of the people in our community don't really f have sensations like that, so they might feel different kinds of things. They might have an increased spasticity. Um, they might develop a fever, 
or um, you might develop um, a new case or an increase in autonomic dysreflexia. So let me stop there for a minute because autonomic dysreflexia is a medical emergency and you do need medical attention to that. Some people have chronic cases and they've learned how to manage it uh, within their own environment, and that's great. If you have questions about autonomic dysreflexia, there are wonderful resources on the Christopher and Dana Reeve Paralysis Foundation webpage. Um, they're called Wallet Cards. And so it's a little trifold uh, card. You can print it off. You can put it in your wallet. It's the size of a dollar bill when it's folded up. There are a variety of topics that all have to do with emergencies. So you can, if you think that you're having autonomic dysreflexia, you need to go to the ER. You might get there and you might not have a person who's familiar with autonomic dysreflexia or maybe they haven't heard about it since they were in medical school or, you know, there's just a, a variety. They do teach it, but maybe they've not even seen a person with spinal cord injury. It is a very rare occurrence, actually. So they might not have seen somebody who had a spinal cord injury and for, for quite a while. So you can use this wallet card as a way of, uh, you know, here's some information I have about this. There's the sign and symptoms um, for the different medical emergencies that are secondary complications for spinal cord injury. You can hand it to the people in the ER. It's kind of a neutral um, way of saying, I think I have this, what's your opinion? And then they can look at this, but there's also information specifically to the healthcare provider that shows the research of this is how this medical condition should be treated. People find it very, very helpful. People end up, um, the medical professionals end up really liking it, and it kind of is a bridge instead of going in, well, I have this, doctor, this is what I've diagnosed myself as, and, and the doctor's thinking, well, you know, I'll make that diagnosis. So it kind of works as a little bridge, but I digress there. But look up those wallet cards and carry them with you because they can be very, very handy. So um, the common medications for bladder infections first is antibiotics. Antibiotics come in something called generations. Um, the first generations are the first antibiotics that were developed, so things like penicillin and all the different d types of penicillin. Then there's second generation antibiotics. They're a little bit stronger. They're a little bit higher. I use the word stronger a little bit loosely, and I'm going to explain why that is. And then there's also a third generation of antibiotics, and those are like really powerful antibiotics that treat a lot of things. So um, people will say, oh, I want the most powerful one. Well, you really don't. When you have that urinalysis, um, if, if an infection shows up, they will then do a test on the same sample. You don't have to provide more. But they'll do a sample on the urine called the culture and sensitivity. And that will say specifically what kind of infection you have in your urine. So why does it matter? Because if you can treat your urine infection with that lowest level of antibiotic, you will be doing yourself a favor because bacteria learns, bacteria, they don't have a brain. They, they're not reasoning this out. But bacteria learns how to morph itself into other things. So if you start taking an antibiotic, that bacteria is going to start changing into a different kind of bacteria because it wants to survive at all costs. So it starts morphing into something else. If you take your antibiotic, you take all of you need to take all of it until it's completely consumed because the full prescription will treat and kill the bacteria that you have. If you say, gee, I'm feeling better, my fever's gone, I don't have any chills, I'm not sweating anymore, I feel much better, I'm going to stop before, my, um, before I finish my prescription, that bacteria is no longer under the control of the antibiotics, so it's going to start changing into something else so it can survive. Then you need a higher level and a higher level of antibiotic to kill the new bacteria that's in there. So you need to take the full prescription, and that should take care of the bacteria. Very rarely it doesn't, and, and then you have to take maybe the prescription for a little bit longer, 
or, you know, do other things, maybe get a higher level. But almost all the time, the back, the first prescription that you have will treat that. Now, why don't you want to take the higher level ones? Because they're so much stronger. Um, and what happens is the more and more of those higher level back, uh, antibiotics that you take, the more resistant bacteria becomes in your body just in general. So if you keep taking higher and higher level of antibiotics, it's going to be harder and harder to treat the next infection that you have. So you always want to tr stay with the lowest level of antibiotic that treats your um, infection. What we're seeing across the United States today is that so many people are given, oh, you have an infection, well, here's the highest level of antibiotics. Boy, that's going to power this infection out of you. But what it's doing is making the bacteria in your body, in your body more resistant to bacteria, uh, to antibiotic treatment. So we have kind of a little epidemic in our country where there are people who they can't take any more antibiotics. They've either developed an allergy to them or the, any antibiotic that they are taking will no longer kill the bacteria that their body is confronting. And so that's a real it's a real problem because there is no treatment then for that infection. So it gets kind of dicey, um, even into life and death types of situations. So you always want the lowest level. Now, researchers are working on fourth generation now antibiotics, but, you know, each generation they develop becomes more and more complicated in the development. So that's the number one um, medication. Now, when you get into other medications, there are problems that can develop in in the bladder. Um, th those are the medications, how medications work for infections. There are other medications uh, to treat bladder issues in general. So what happens is that when your bladder works, the bladder um, squeezes. It's, the bladder is a muscle. It's um, uh, straight muscle tissue, so it's a certain kind of muscle tissue as opposed to the muscles that are in your arms or your cardiac muscles. So it's uh, muscles that contract, and um, so when the bladder reaches a certain capacity, the muscle starts com contracting, and when it starts contracting without the spinal cord injury, it's sending a signal to the brain that you need to start looking, you might need to start thinking about toileting. And the contractions get stronger and stronger until a person thinks, wow, I really need to go right now. Um, so hopefully you go before you get to that point. After a spinal cord injury, that, mus that muscle contraction may not be transmitted to the brain because the bowel and bladder nerves are at the bottom of the spinal cord. So just about anybody who has a spinal cord injury of any type is going to have trouble uh, noticing when they have to go to the bathroom. But those contra contractions are still going to happen because your body is still working below the level of your spinal cord injury. The messages just are not getting to your brain. So those muscles are still contracting in your bladder. If you have spasticity, they might just contract uh, willy-nilly because spasticity is, is causing a contraction because the muscles are trying to work and they're not receiving that message from the brain that you need to go to the bathroom. <clears throat> so they kind of don't know what to do with those messages. So sometimes that's how spasticity develops. If you have spasticity in your body and it's usually from those uh, cervical and thoracic uh, injuries are usually have... Um, are equated with spasticity. The um, lumbar and sacral injuries are usually have more flaccid, uh, flaccid kind of injuries, so there's not so much spasticity. If you have a spinal cord injury from a medical cause, you could have a mix, so you could have a lower level injury and still have spasticity. Or sometimes people just have this kind of mixed thing going on with spasticity and flaccid flaccidity so it just is but in general it's the two upper um, injuries have more spasticity you can see that spasm in your arm and legs you might not see it 
in your bladder. But if you have spasticity in your body, you have it internally probably as well. So sometimes those um, bladder contractions get out of whack and there's uh, medications that can calm those bladder contractions. There's another um, part to this whole bladder thing and that's that sphincter that's at the end of the bladder and sometimes it spasms and contracts so tightly and if you have these kind of spasms, maybe you have tried to catheterize and the catheter won't go in for some reason. And it's probably because that sphincter is so tightly contracted from a spasm. If you wait a little while, it relaxes and the catheter goes right in. So sometimes that sphincter tightens too, uh, gets too tight and there's medications that can calm that. Sometimes the bladder contraction and the sphincter are not working in unison. So when the bladder contracts, the sphincter has to open. If the bladder contracts and the sphincter does not open, if it's contracted, that's going to build pressure up in your bladder. And where is that going to go? The urine can't go with the contraction and shoot out the urethra, so it's going to back up into the kidneys. That's called bladder sphincter dyssynergia, DSD. That's really um, a mouthful, isn't it? But when that's usually diagnosed by the urodynamic testing, and so medication can be given so that those two, uh, the sphincter and the bladder, work in unison again. Now, sometimes the sphincter becomes just uh, flaccid, especially in those lower level uh, injuries where it's just open because it's not going to contract and it's not going to stay tight. There's also medications for that. Now, with spasticity, usually what happens is uh, people who don't want to take oral medication that works throughout the whole body, then people will opt for Botox injections into their bladder, which can kind of help relax some of that spasticity that's going on so they don't have to take medications. So that's another option, too, and that's becoming more and more popular because it's just a pill you don't have to take. And so, and it works really well. It's kind of a little um, bit of experimentation, I'm going to say, into getting just the right amount of Botox. But if you have a person who's um, uh, experienced in doing it, they can usually catch it right away with just the most perfect amount. So um, that's pretty much it for those uh, bladder medications. So, um, gosh, that was an awful lot of talking about the bladder. So let's go ahead and talk about some other things. Oh, there was another question um, just real quick. Is there a specific doctor for spinal cord injury uh, individual who should see, the, who they should see about spasticity? So since we're talking about spasticity anyway, um, usually the physiatrist who is a specialist in rehabilitation medicine or a neurologist, it's usually your general person who's taking care of you um, that will deal with the spasticity. Uh, if you live in a place where you go to a general practitioner, they, w they will know about spasticity as well. Um, so you're pretty much safe with your regular healthcare professional in dealing with spasticity. There's also a lot of information about spasticity on the website, on the REVE website. So you can inform yourself as well. I have several blogs about spasticity. And there are specific medications that are all listed there that you can kind of think, well, hmm, maybe I should ask about this one, if this one's right for me, or whatever. Sometimes the spasticity medicine, um, if you're taking it orally, it can make you really tired. And so that's why some people don't like it. They get the brain fog when they're on it because the med when you take medicine orally, it travels completely throughout your whole body. And so it affects all the muscles in your body or, you know, it travels through your brain, it travels through everything in your body. So sometimes people don't like that feeling that they get. Another thing is spasticity is such a little... Um, um, bad actor in that when you have spasticity and you start taking medication, you're on a low dose and you're thinking, oh, okay, this is cool, I'm getting along fine with this. Sometimes there's an adjustment period to the medication 
And so what happens is um, people think, okay, I've, I've been on this medication, the brain fog's left me, I'm feeling pretty good. But spasticity gets used to being on that medication and it gets stronger and so you need to up your dose of medication now uh it used to be a lot of things like valium were given for spasticity not so much anymore because it's um caught up in this opioid crisis in that it's one of the medications that are, is no lo- it's very hard for a pre- for a prescriber to prescribe valium But there are some medications that can help spasticity, um, medications that are used for other things that, given in very, very small doses, can help with spasticity. So uh, baclofen is a drug that's prescribed for spasticity, and it's one of those drugs that you start out on a small amount and then you might find, and it might take years before maybe you need to go up on it, now, the strange thing about spasticity is people find that they're going up on it, going up on it. Sometimes people find that they want to change their medication. You have to go completely off one, and you need to go on to another. Sometimes people will find that um, when they change their medication and they go off a drug, that their spasticity is just gone. It's just suddenly resolved, and that's kind of a weird kind of thing, but it, it does happen. And you never know when it's going to happen. The important thing about these medications for spasticity is you must never stop them cold turkey. Never, 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 never. I cannot stress that enough. I have a lot of people who I tell them not to do that, and they come back and they're like, oh, my spasticity is so so much worse. These are drugs that have to be tapered off. Do not be a he man or he woman and think you can cold turkey it off. It's not that kind of withdrawal. Your body has become used to having these medications. And when you suddenly stop them, you send your body into a huge crisis. So not only does the pain, spasticity and the pain come back worse, and immediately it's much, much worse, But also, it's very hard when you've been off the medication suddenly and you start going back on it. It does not work. And it's very difficult to treat the spasticity or the pain that comes with the spasticity, neuropathic pain. It's very, very hard to get onto a new medication regimen when you've suddenly stopped it. So never, ever do that. Always talk to your healthcare professional about an appropriate weaning plan to get off these medications. So that is just like a critical piece of information. So um, your regular doctor can certainly treat you for spasticity, and so that works out really well. That's like one less specialty that you have to go see. Um, there is a question in the queue here about baclofen, are baclofen pumps used for spasticity in, in MS useful for SEI? And yes, that's a so Yes, they are. Um, So it's not unusual for people who have spinal cord injury to get a baclofen pump. What will happen is people start out on taking baclofen by mouth, and they will, um, you know, they'll be getting some, uh, it's usually the lower doses of baclofen, and they'll be getting some relief from that. Now, sometimes people have to go on to such higher doses of uh, baclofen that they no longer can take it by mouth. Um, for spasticity, sometimes you know people will not want to take the oral medication, but they'll go to the Botox, and that's an injection just into the muscle of the body where uh, the spasticity is occurring. So that does not go, you know, affect your whole body. That just affects where it's happening. Now, people will usually find success for that, but there's some people whose spasticity is uh, just so rampant throughout their body that they either need more baclofen than can be prescribed by mouth or they need to have so many injections with the Botox that, you know, the the, um, spasticity is so widespread that uh, Botox is just becoming too unwieldy. And so then the baclofen pump is is prescribed. It's a little... um, 
pump that's put into the abdomen. It's a surgical implant. It's about the size of a heart pacemaker, but it has baclofen medication in it. And then a tube comes around from the abdomen, and it's surgically uh, tracked around to the spinal column. It does not go into the spinal cord, but it goes into the sac that holds the spinal cord. So where your cerebral spinal fluid is, that part that that fluid that uh, surrounds your brain and your spinal cord. And the baclofen is slowly, slowly dripped right into that cerebral spinal uh, cord so it relaxes all the spasticity in the, in usually in the lower part of your body. Now, if you have really bad spasticity in the higher parts of your body as well, the, ba- the uh, tube can be placed higher in the spinal cord but when you get into these higher levels, you need a, a specialist that does a lot of baclofen uh, pumps. So not everybody, even though people place baclofen pumps, not everybody does the higher level placements, but it can be done. You just have to find the doctor um, that can do that. And the reason for that is baclofen is heavier than spinal fluid. So it stays in the lower part of your spinal cord and it relaxes, it bathes your spinal cord and your body just relaxes. When the pump gets, when the uh, tube of the pump gets placed in higher, when you're laying down, it can be uh, too close to your breathing center. And that's why people are have to have a very good knowledge of how to put these higher level uh baclofen pumps in. But it's not at all uncommon to have a lower level baclofen pump put in if you have a lot of spasticity. Now, it's not the kind of thing, well, I'll have that baclofen pump. It's, you know, it's it's a big surgery to have this implanted. And so you need to know if it's going to work before you put it in. And so there's a trial where you go in and you have a procedure, it's a lumbar puncture, and they put the baclofen in, just an injection into that uh, cerebral spinal fluid. The body, it's just, it's such a miracle. It really is a miracle when you see this happen or when people have it. They're just like, I can't believe how great, if it works for them, they'll just be shocked at how great it works. Now, the bad part is that, that will wear off, and you have to wait then to have surgery. You have to get insurance to get the. Now you've passed the test. You have to get approval from the insurance to have the pump put in. Then you have to schedule the surgery. And people are like, "No, I want that feeling of relief right now," and justifiably so. So there is that period of um, waiting, and I only stress it because people get very, very frustrated once they've had the sensation. And if the baclofen works in the spine, they want that pump right now. And it's so hard to wait. And it's hard for me to see people wait, if you can believe that, because it just is such a difference. Uh, Baclofen pumps are also put into children, so pediatric cases. Um, And I see the angst on the parents' faces when their child gets this relief. And, you know, as a parent, you feel like, oh, I've helped my child. And it's such a wonderful experience. And then, um, you know, this waiting time is its just unfortunate that, you know, it can't be like, well, if the pump works, then do the surgery right that day because people really want that. But unfortunately, that is not the way that that works, and that's such a sad state of affairs. Um, so anyway, people who get the pump, if the pump, if they pass the test and the pump works, it's really a magnificent thing. Another thing about the pump is that pain medication can also be added to the pump. Some people will use the pump just for pain medication if they have really bad neuropathic pain. It was originally designed for uh, spasticity and for baclofen. It's given in huge doses that you could not possibly digest the amount of the dose, dose that's put in the pump. But pain medication can also be put in there. You can get the pump with just baclofen. You could get a pump for neuropathic pain that is just um, pain medication that bathes the spinal cord. Or you can get a combination of both. So if your spasms are leading to neuropathic pain or if you also have neuropathic pain, you can get these combinations. Now, the pump has to be refilled about every three to four, maybe maybe some people can go six months um, with uh, 
before getting their pump refilled. That can be done in the physician's office. And it's done with a needle. It's injected into the abdomen. Um, if you have sensation there, uh, they can put some uh, numbing medication so you don't feel it. But um, medication just gets injected right into the pump, and then you just go on about your merry way right from the physician's office. Um, the pump battery does have to be changed, but that's you know that's um, much longer process before the battery has to be cha- years before it has to be changed. So, you know there there's a lot of work, a lot of follow up that has to be done with this uh, pump, but people who have it really really like it. Um, you can even adjust the pump uh, so you get different amounts of baclofen during the day. So maybe if you don't have as much spasticity at night, you can have less medication. Maybe if you need more when you're doing your ADLs in the morning, it might help you. Uh, some people might cut down on the baclofen pump when they're getting up because they use a little spasticity to help them transfer. Um, spasticity sometimes can be used to your advantage, and transferring is um one of those options, and so sometimes that uh, medication can be adjusted depending on your activity uh, during a usual day. So anyway, I, yeah, I I have always found people who have uh, the pump really are really doing well with it. Um, they usually like it. Um, here's a question that's a little different vein of thought, but um, this uh, person's husband is on a ventilator, um, so he gets nothing by mouth, but he has severe pain uh, due to uh, swallowing saliva due to some overgranulation. And uh, to remove the surgical replies er, requires a hospital stay, which, you know, of course, during this COVID, as we all certainly understand that. And also, if you have a spinal cord injury, this would be a high-level injury. But even if you have a low-level injury, really think long and hard about the risk and benefits of having surgery because it is um, it is more um, risky to have surgery after any kind of spinal cord injury. Um, for a ventilatory patient, um, they're on the ventilator already, so... Um, that's at least helpful. If you're off the ventilator but have a high-level injury, sometimes it's hard to get off the ventilator after surgery. You have to go through that whole process again. Um, Even people who have lower-level injuries sometimes have difficulty breathing um, because of the muscle dysfunction even in the abdomen. So always think long and hard about this. Now, this sounds like a real problem, and it sounds like surgery would be the intervention, and it sounds like the benefits would greatly outweigh the risk, but that is up to your husband and you to decide. So those are some questions. So uh, he has some pain relief cream applied to the neck. Um, Sometimes keeping things moist in there, if he's able to take... Um, like some lemon swabs or something to kind of moisten that area, clean that area, soothe that area. Um, I don't know what his restrictions are, so he can't take fluid in by mouth. Uh, but sometimes maybe you know something like that might overstimulate uh, the saliva production as well. Um, sometimes there are some numbing agents that can be used and applied with one of those um, sticks again. You'll have to talk to your uh, individual physician, uh, but sometimes there are some oral numbing gels. Um, usually, they're swish, swish, and uh, uh, spit out. Or um, so th- this would be out of the question in this particular case. But sometimes you can put them on a swab, and you're not really putting large amounts of that oral numbing cream in the mouth. Um, so that might be an option maybe to think about. That's really being it between, uh, the situation's really between a rock and a hard place. Um, now, the hospitals are saying that they are completely uh, sanitary right now um, and that, you know, that they've uh, mitigated the some of the risk of the COVID. But, you know, whenever we're out, and I always like to bring up, you know, these are such difficult times. People who have spinal cord injury are immunocompromised. I myself am immunocompromised from another situation altogether. But I have to say that I 
I see people out and I see people on the TV out and I think, I want to go out too. And the viral load, guess what, is gone way up through the roof in a lot of places in our country. So I see a commercial on TV and it's a, it's about a lady and she says um, her disease is relentless, but she's relentless, relentless too. And I think, okay, um, COVID is a very uh, tough situation, but I am tough too. So, you know, please stay in, wear your mask, do your hand washing, avoid crowd, just be very cautious now because we are all at a risk where the outcome would be very bad. Some people think, oh, I'm young, I'm healthy. Um, This COVID affects everybody, so just be very careful. Um, Here's somebody who says, hi, Linda, and I want to say hi back. Um, to Evelyn there. I appreciate that shout out. Um, Okay, here's another question. I haven't had until now uh, the uh, UTI in over two years and she's taking cranberry supplements. I used to have uh, UTIs every three weeks and multiple ED visits. So good, good, good. Um, Cranberry, interesting. So back in the day we used to give people cranberry juice and apple juice. Um, we gave it separately and we gave it together. Some people just didn't like the taste of cranberry juice, so they used apple juice. And um, that has been research. Well, first of all, when you drink the juice, you're putting a tremendous amount of sugar into your body. And so it's good to avoid uh, too much uh, juices because people who have uh, spinal cord injury uh, can become insulin resistant. It's a secondary complication of spinal cord injury. It does not happen to everyone. But you really want to monitor your sugar intake and because you don't want to have diabetes on top of spinal cord injury as well. So um, if you uh, want to do the cranberry thing, there are people like this person, uh, Tim, who's swearing by it, it looks like, and some people do. They take this and it just reduces all of their urinary tract infections. Um, The research says that it really does nothing. I don't know. Back in the day, I would give um, people uh, cranberry juice, that's back when we gave it, or uh, cranberry tablets, and then we would check the pH of their urine, and it would certainly become more acidic, and a bacteria has a harder time living in an acidic environment. But that does not work for everyone. So if you want to try the cranberry supplements, there's some new supplements out on the market that are cranberry supplements and mixed with sugar. Be sure you get the kinds of cranberry supplements without sugar. If you want to try it, you know, do your own experimentation. Uh, check with your healthcare professional to make sure that there's no reason why you shouldn't be doing that. And... Um, So, you know, uh, try it if you think you would like to, but check to make sure that, you know, about the amount of sugar that you're taking in and check with your healthcare professional. Sometimes when you're taking supplements, you're just drinking more water to get those pills down. So that could also be a, a factor in there. But, you know, I know people who tell me that it just works, it works, it works, but I have to be... I have to be full disclosure, the research right now is evidence that it doesn't, but something is happening because there are people who, and there are other people who take the supplements and they're like, well, you know, it's not, it does, didn't work at all. So um, if you want to experiment with that, talk to your healthcare professional. It might just be the thing that will work with you. Um, here's a person that's asking about the PureWix system. Is it a good op- option for females who self calf I never get to sleep through the night because I have to calf between three to five times once I go to bed, usually um, 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. Um, so, you know, um, check with your healthcare professional for your individual needs. Um, some people use that and they like it. It's always better to be doing the independent cath- uh, the intermittent catheterization because you are mimicking the natural action of the bladder, and so you're not leaving any kind of catheter in your bladder, and it's 
if the, when you have a catheter in your bladder, that's an open conduit for infection. Now, a lot of people have indwelling catheters or suprapubic catheters because they have a medical need to have them that way. And so that is an option. Um, um, hmm, the Purewick. Now, that would be an interesting thing. Um, there are some devices that are out now where there's it's kind of more like a collection outside of the bladder. You are holding that urine up next to your bladder, so that does leave the opportunity for bacteria to crawl back up in there. Um, I don't think that there's probably enough information about it outright yet for people who have spinal cord injury to see if that collection system would allow more bacteria to collect. Once urine is out of the bladder and it's uh, collected in even another system or um, it's held close to the urethra, you have the chance of that bacteria, you know, bacteria is very, very small, so it has a chance of coming up. So I think we're going to have to get more information. Now, for people who have to uh, catheterize, uh, who are doing intermittent catheterization, if you lay down, oh, 20 minutes to an hour before you go to bed, so if you're watching TV, if you're reading a book, if you're doing something, um, talking on the phone, you know, whatever activity you like to do in the evening time. Sometimes when you put your feet up, um, the, uh, the fluid, even if you don't see edema in your legs, there might be some fluid in there from your legs being dependent and not moving all day. So when you put your feet up, a lot of times that fluid will travel. It gets Your legs are up high, as high as your heart and that fluid will travel to your bladder for removal, and so your bladder over distends. So sometimes if you uh, have your feet up or you lay in bed for about 20 minutes to an hour before you catheterize and then make your last catheterization for the night, that fluid can be removed, and so you have a less chance of overfilling your bladder. Um, 5 to 10 uh, a.m., 10 or 10 p.m. to 5 a.m., that's a pretty long time, not unusual, but sometimes if you um, drain that bladder after that fluid from your legs is gone, that's helpful. So I will make that uh, suggestion, but I don't think there's really any research out. I'm sure if you talk to the people at that company, um, they'll say it's just fine, but you know, since uh, people with Spinal cord injury have decreased uh, your um, immune systems. It, you know, it could. We'll have to see. But what, what I'm trying to say is, we'll have to see how that parrots out. Okay, so um, let's see. What could cause extreme sudden autonomic dysreflexia? Uh, high blood pressure, violent body spasm, difficulty breathing, and feeling stress. How can these symptoms be resolved fast if, if there's not an obvious cause and how can it be prevented? Well, there is a cause that's, ca that's causing that um, AD to happen. So finding the cause is going to be the answer. So if you've, checked your, um, if you've checked your catheter, if you have checked your bowels, if you've looked for anything constricting your body, too tight shoes, a leg bag... You know, you put your leg bag on and it's loose, and then as it fills with urine, it gets tighter and tighter. So checking the leg bag, making sure it's not overfilled. Some people have AD for the oddest of reasons. Some people are so sensitive to AD that even just the air in the house blowing across their body can stimulate AD. Um, getting too cold, being too hot, there's all kinds of situations that can trigger it. So if you're having frequent of these really violent AD episodes, you might want to talk about your, to your doctor about getting on some medication to, um, to resolve that uh, situation. So, it, it, you know, um, if you can't find any reason for it, there is a reason that's causing it, but you don't know what the reason is that's causing it. You want to talk to your physician about getting on some medication that can help reduce those symptoms because you don't want to be in a in having frequent episodes of AD and that blood pressure getting up so high. 
the huge problem with AD is that you could end up with a stroke, and you don't want that. Um, so, you know, it's just, and plus, you know, it doesn't feel good to have that. So check with your physician and see if you can get on some medication that can help reduce those incidences. Um, so what neurological conditions can predispose a patient to lower extremity spasticity? Um, in a patient with a history of T TBI, so uh, traumatic brain injury, that's a, a TBI, uh, can also cause spasticity in that um, those messages are not being interpreted correctly by the brain. And so that can cause uh, some spasticity as well. So um, it could be the TBI itself that is causing the uh, spasticity in the lower extremities. Now, sometimes people can have a spinal cord injury, and so when they present to the emergency room, um, you know, it's obvious this person has a spinal cord injury, and they start, you know, treatment for that. You go through rehabilitation for that. But oftentimes, people with a spinal cord injury have a traumatic brain injury, and it goes unrecognized. It's not until the person gets home that the family's like, you know, our pers our loved one's behavior has really changed. If you think about higher level injuries, that if you have a spinal cord injury that is severe enough, that produces um, uh, uh, spinal cord injury, that could also shake the head around because, you know, your head is held up by this little tiny structure called the neck. And so if you have a spinal cord injury in a higher level, your head could have been bumped by something and, and that traumatic brain injury is often left unrecognized. On the other hand, people who have traumatic brain injury that had an injury that's severe enough that has uh, disturbed their brain within their head to give them this traumatic brain injury could have some trauma to their spinal cord that has gone unrecognized. It, the, spi the spasticity could be from a spinal cord injury or it could just be from misinterpretation of messages within the brain because of the injury to the brain. So the treatments are still the same as far as um, what we discussed earlier about um, spasticity. So is it more prevalent in patients with a history of TBI? Well, it could be. Um, it just depends on where the injury is to the brain and how the brain's been affected. Other neurological conditions that could produce, uh, produce uh, lower extremity spasticity are cerebral palsy, um, uh, multiple sclerosis, are just about any uh, neurological injury to the spinal cord. Um, so it happens in both brain injury and um, spinal cord injury. Um, the next question is, are antibiotics uh, are hard on the gut? Is there anything more natural or less harmful to the gut instead of antibiotics? Well, if you, need, if you have a bacteria, um, you have to take an antibiotic. Um, so there is no treatment for bacteria. There's no natural cure for that. Um, you can help reduce your risk, doing all those things to reduce your risk for urinary tract infection or, um, you know, keeping your body healthy. Um, if you have a cut and it gets infected, uh, cleaning it with soap and water uh, is helpful with the initial cut. So there's all things, kinds of things you can do to help reduce your risk of getting infection. But if you have an infection, especially with a spinal cord injury, you are going to need to take antibiotics to do that. Be sure and read on your packaging if you can take food or fluid before you take the antibiotics. Some you can, some you cannot. Some if you take um, food or fluid before you take the antibiotic, it's going to reduce the effectiveness. Other antibiotics you can. So if you have a cracker or if you drink some milk to kind of coat the stomach or, or put something in your stomach, but you have to check the product uh, packaging to see if you can do that before. Um, so how do you contact Nurse Linda? Well, I see our time is up, so we'll end at that. If I haven't asked answered your question because I see there's a few more down the list. I wish I could get to them all because, oh, they're 
there's some great um, questions on here. Um, so um, how do you get in contact with me? Well, every Wednesday evening I'm on the community, which is at the Christopher and Dana Reeve Paralysis webpage. And there's a little um, inbox, so if you want to contact me privately, you can uh, put a message into my inbox there, and then um, I can get that and respond to you directly. Or if you um, if you want to ans- ask a question publicly, you can just put it on the community. Now, if if you don't have a personal, um, uh, if you don't want to keep the, your question private. I do encourage you to put it out publicly because I can guarantee you if you have this question, about 100 other people do as well. And so sometimes people have the question, but they don't really even know they have that question. So it's always good if you can ask it publicly if you don't have, if you don't have to give private information or whatever. Be sure and put that information out there for the community. It's very, very helpful. Um, and attach it to... Um, uh, ask Nurse Linda, so I'm sure to get it. If I don't answer your question, it's because I haven't received it. It hasn't been tagged for me. Because I do answer all the questions, and I answer them every Wednesday night. And I will answer them intermittently. If it's tagged to me and it comes up, I will answer those questions anytime you put them in there. But Wednesday night, I'm always in there, so and that's that's a for sure time. Now, if you uh, uh, also have some questions and you want to talk to people, I do want to alert you to the fact that there are information specialists that are available also at the Christopher and Dana Reeve Paralysis Foundation, and they are wealths of information. They know things inside and out, and they also are able to, if they're um, on that rare, very rare occasion when they can't answer questions, they will contact me and ask me so that um, we do have a chance to communicate. So I thank you very much for listening today. It's just been wonderful to talk um, with you, even though I'm the one who does all the talking, but you talk through those questions. Um, uh, Oh, I do want to answer. There's another question that has come up uh, through differently, and it's it's an important question. Um, So can you please advise me which one is better, the suprapubic catheter or the daily cathing? Well, the daily cathing is the one that acts most like the way the bladder normally responds without a spinal cord injury. Um, It has the least chance of infection, and so that is what is advised. The suprapubic catheter is only recommended when you have some other kind of issue with your bladder. So it's not an either-or thing, like should I choose between these two. Suprapubics are put in um, for people who have uh, spasticity in their bladder or the uh, pressure in their bladder is so great that there's a real risk of harming the kidneys because once you damage your kidneys, there's no getting that back. So um, it's a it, uh, suprapubic catheter has a medical necessity need, needed to it. Otherwise, the intermittent catheterization is really the best because it, it has less chance for infection and it mimics the normal way the bladder works, which is really important to keep your body working in the most natural fashion as you can. But if you do have problems um, that you do need a suprapubic catheter, you know, that's a whole nother layer of medical issue. So with that, I could talk all day, but with that, I'll um, sign off. Again, if I did not get to your question, be sure and put it on the community, or I will be on next month, and I'll be looking forward to it. And please, please be very mindful of the COVID because we are tough. So thank you for listening today, and with that, I will sign off.